Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to the Underground. This is the briefing for Wednesday, November 3rd, 2021, and it is being recorded on the 2nd of November, the day prior, as usual. So first off, a brief disclaimer. Sorry uh, if the audio is not great on this particular episode. I know we're not really known for great audio here, but uh, the uh, local government in our filming location is doing some kind of god-awful project, and they are making all kinds of racket with about as many machines as you could possibly imagine. So um, while the local government continues to destroy my little local area here, uh, I'm going to try to muddle through this brief as best I can. So sorry if the audio is a little bit weird. Starting off with the weather, we can see that uh, winter has arrived in some parts of the country, and as usual, uh, we've got a lot of weather advisories, which we'll see on the next slide. Uh, But really, the only thing to note for now is uh, that we are in a red alum cycle, so lunar illumination is going to be at 7.2%, so really dark nights, and as you can see, uh, I threw the uh, moonrise and moonset times on there as well, because that's kind of super important to deal with illumination, right? So... Um, the, the moon can be a, as bright as it wants to be, but if it's below the horizon, it doesn't really matter, right? So as we can see, the moon set time is at 6.07 p.m., and the lunar illumination is again at 7.2%. And like I mentioned, as far as advisories, we've got a lot of advisories going on through Oklahoma and Kansas uh, and some spotty stuff out on the West Coast as usual, but that's that's typical for this time of year. No TAMs for this cycle, not really a whole lot going on, nothing major to report. There are a few, but it's mostly stuff like space launches and things that you know are, are pretty typical. Nothing like that jumped out at me is worth briefing. And as far as civil unrest goes, uh, we there are some updates, but I'll have to talk about the civil unrest situation as we kind of go along through the brief. Uh, really, the biggest thing to note is New York City. Uh, again, uh, the medical mandates are, are wreaking havoc on the uh, local first responders and, and policing organizations in New York City, but... But again, we'll talk about that further. And also, I threw this little box on there because I'm seeing a lot of talk about it. Uh, there's a, a nationwide public service walkout. I've seen a lot of posters going around. Um, I don't know about anybody else, but it, it seems like there have been a lot, a lot of just random posters uh, going around advertising these kinds of walkouts, all with different dates. So I've seen some that say uh, November 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, on up, you know, through throughout the whole month. Um, and really, there's there's no real like organization. Like there's n- they're not tied to an organization. They're not. Uh, nobody has their like name on it, so you can't like contact an organization to find out more. It's just these random posters. So I don't know what's going on. You know, it could be some kind of conspiracy. Who knows? I just wanted to point out that there are a lot that seem to be circulating now that the public service industry. Uh, has uh, started to get these mandates and uh, it's become kind of popular for the uh, uh, public service industries to resist that. But again, we'll talk more about that in just a minute. And moving into logistics. So I know that it's kind of a fighting a losing battle to kind of track all these logistical problems in the country, but uh, uh, just want to run through some of the ones we talked about last time. School bus shortage, of course, continuing in Ohio and Massachusetts has gotten a lot worse, of course. Um, we also have the water shortage out west, which has become a problem, uh, although that will probably alleviate itself, like I keep mentioning, with the precipitation this winter. We have the microchip shortage that's impacting uh, auto manufacturers. Most auto manufacturers are either canceling outright uh, this year's model of car, or they are not able to provide them uh, whatsoever. So, huge problem that will con- that will continue to be a problem for the next at least two years. That's what most people are predicting. Also, Texas's liquor shortage seems to still be in play, although I'm really not sure as to the extent of it. Um, it seems like it's a pretty severe problem, but again, you're not really going to be able to logistically check out every liquor store in Texas. It's kind of a hard thing to do. Uh, but new for this cycle, we have Michigan. So Michigan is reporting Uh, They have problems with snowplow and salt truck drivers. They're having a driver shortage of those vehicles. So, again, the trucking shortage that we've been talking about for months now, has uh, it's upon us again with the winter season because you have to have uh, certain drivers that are trained to drive uh, snowplows and salt trucks. So, again, that's going to be a huge problem for the northern states. So far, I've only seen problems in Michigan, but I am sure that other states like Wisconsin, Minnesota, you know, New York, Maine, all those you know places like that they get really a uh, heavy snowfall and and really uh, use a lot of their snow plows in the winter time are going to have uh, some some pretty big problems with uh, workers not being there to uh, plow the roads 
Also, this cycle we have in Montana, uh, there we've seen several local news agencies reporting uh, tire shortages. So as people move into the winter time, they try to get new tires, and uh, it's uh, there's there's a tire shortage apparently. So a lot of uh, a lot of tire shops and uh, mechanics are actually reporting that they have a several month wait time for new tires. So I'm sure this is not just a problem with Montana, but a problem nationwide because a lot of our tires are imported. Uh, a lot are made here, but a lot of them are imported as well and if the demand spikes in any one area you're going to have a shortage no matter what so that's going to be a huge problem as we move into the winter and also california so california uh, this this story is kind of a uh, kind of a disclaimer for it is the only source i've been able to find for it is a mainstream media source so take it for what it's worth but california reportedly allegedly has a glass shortage at least in the san francisco area now the article itself was kind of hilarious because clearly the pe- person who wrote it wanted to talk about the glass shortage and and how like logistics are a problem but what they ended up doing was admitting that so many people are having their cars broken into in San Francisco that there's now a shortage of replacement car windows. So I thought that was kind of hilarious that they ended up wanting to talk about one issue but ended up kind of highlighting another problem which is crime. So that's interesting to note. And then finally a brief note I have here is to talk about is that there appears to be a shortage of diesel exhaust fluid. So for those of you that don't know uh, this is something that the Federal administration kind of came up with, uh, again, to kind of um, prevent emissions. Really, it's just kind of a, it's a, it's an issue all on its own. Uh, people that are in the trucking industry and the diesel vehicle game uh, know a lot more about this. Uh, so you can research it on your own. Uh, just kind of the travesty that is this thing called diesel exhaust fluid or diesel emissions fluid, depending on which which acronym we want to go with. But DEF uh, shortages uh, appear to be quite rampant in some areas, um, and they are required to even uh, start up a lot of d- diesel vehicles. So um, a lot of diesel manufacturers are required to purposefully impact their vehicles and make it so the vehicle won't even turn on unless you have a full tank of diesel exhaust fluid so something to keep in mind i'm sure that the trucking industry already knows about this a lot you know a lot more than we do but i just wanted to point it out for those of you who who don't uh don't drive diesel vehicles and before we jump into the critical updates and significant government election slide there's something that i wanted to talk about very briefly uh, because this is kind of a big deal at this point, and that is the actual mandates themselves. So we throw around this this word mandate, and I don't think a lot of people understand what's going on. So uh, I myself certainly don't understand what's going on to a certain degree, um, but I think I've got kind of a general understanding of what's going on, and I wanted to point out there's a very clear distinction with what this, this mandate stuff is. So a lot of people are talking about this particular mandate, right? The one they hear that they hear it on all the mainstream media about how every private company with 100 or more employees must get uh, every employee to get the jab, right? Or, or else they're going to be fined or something, right? Some ambiguous threat against them, right? Well, this this uh, mandate is actually this is this is just a press release. There is no actual. There's nothing in writing right now, either from OSHA or from anybody else. Or from there's no executive order that talks about every private companies with 100 or more employees. There is nothing in writing with this that we could find. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of the thing there. Now here's the deal. A lot of conservative news media sites, and I say conservative because it's really only them talking about this, they will say that, oh, there are no mandates whatsoever. There's nothing. It's just a press release. Well, that's not actually true. There is a mandate, and that is the federal contractor mandate. Now, this is this one is actually in writing. You can look it up yourself. It is Executive Order 14043, and it actually has an enforcement arm the, the inside that executive order. Uh, that's the Safer Federal Workforce Task Force. Uh, that's the enforcement arm for this executive order. Now, what that means, I don't know. I don't think that it has any actual enforcement capability whatsoever, but... You can read the EO yourself, and it quite clearly states that uh, federal contractors must be jabbed. This is the one that's in writing. This one is an executive order. Again, it is not an actual law. In fact, you will see this phrase, quote, as required by law at pretty, on pretty much every line of this executive order. So, again, it's ambiguous. But there is a document, a piece of paper that states that there is a mandate in place, and that is Executive Order 14043. 
Now, what does this actually mean? Well, you have to remember, federal contractors means any company that holds federal contracts. Now, again, this is very ambiguous. You can read the executive order yourself and talk about, okay, well, it, what does this really apply to federal contractors or not? Nobody really knows, right? We need Somebody needs to interpret this executive order because it's very ambiguous. So you could argue that Executive Order 14043 technically doesn't talk about federal contractors being mandated. Um, but, yeah, I, I would say that it's it's pretty it's pretty clear the executive order read it yourself it's 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 pretty uh pretty clear um at least to me and, and as far as what a court would say now we have to remember what does federal contractor mean well that means all of these people right all of these industries that hold federal contracts and as you can see it's kind of a lot of industries that's why if you were to see airlines right like all the the, the airline uh, pilots being mandated to get the jab well that's because the airline companies hold contracts with the federal government which is then tied to EO 14043 you see how that works so that's that's why it's not the airlines are not being mandated because they are a private company and the, the you know the 100 or more employees right that they're not being mandated because of that they're being mandated because of the executive order because they are a federal contractor so again this is not a perfect explanation but hopefully this kind of shows like where the lines how how people are the drawing these logistical lines back to some kind of piece of paper right that says that these mandates do exist so again it's very complicated and one can argue that this isn't even real because None of this is actual law, right? And again, however, you have to put that caveat on it. None of this is law, maybe. We don't really know, right? This incident is really causing us to try to work out what the idea of, of a law actually is. And a lot of times this is bringing up questions. So I just wrote down three questions that I kind of had with regards to what this stuff is. And the first one is, if a president makes a verbal statement, i.e. a press release, is that an executive order? Historically, no. Uh, you have to write it down, you have to sign it, and you have to record it with the Federal Register, right? But this is exactly what's happening in a lot of cases. A lot of companies are looking at the Biden regime's 100-person, you know, or else mandate and saying... Okay, well, that's our out now. Now now we have an excuse to Im implement our own policies, even though there's nothing in writing, right? And then you have some other companies that are like, well, yeah, we have more than 100 employees, but the reason that we have to ban or, or, or mandate this stuff is not because of the 100-person mandate, but because we're a federal contractor, right? So we've got this weird, interesting dynamic going on, right? A lot of companies want to have that out. They, they, they're very eager to use the just following orders excuse. They want to have somebody else take the fall for their own company mandates. And for a lot of companies, a press release you know, by the regime, that's enough for them to say, okay, that's an executive order. Biden saying something behind it, you know, reading something off a teleprompter, that's an executive command, so now we have to go with it. Now, again... What does all this mean? Well, a court's got a rule on it, right? So, again, very tough legal questions that are being asked that, honestly, in years past, all of this stuff would have been thrown out because, you know, the court would not have gone this far. But these days, uh, look at what's going on. And that leads us to the second question. If the Supreme Court does not take up a case, does that grant de facto approval? Again, historically, and if you look back at the stuff that's that's happened in our history, no, of course not. The Supreme Court not willing to take up a case does not mean that that case gets approval, right? But in a lot of cases, this is exactly what's happening, or at least it appears to be. So we're in this wishy-washy area where we're really not sure that nobody is <laughs> nobody's saying not to do something, but nobody is also saying to do it as well. So it's, again, really ambiguous, really confusing. And I think this really leads to the third question, which is a very large question that I, myself, and none of the other staff here even hope to have an answer for. But that question is, if something is clearly written in the Constitution, but no court will uphold the Constitution, even if we somehow manage to reverse the wave of authoritarianism that we are experiencing, will our Constitution still be able to stand? 
In other words, if our Constitution allowed this to happen in the first place, if it allowed the exact thing it was written to prevent, such as tyranny and totalitarianism, will it even have any value when the authoritarian regime collapses? And, man, that, that's a question that I don't have the answer to. I don't think anybody has the answer to. Um, but it's something that we're definitely thinking about. And it really does kind of matter when we talk about these kinds of mandates and stuff. So I wanted to talk about this really briefly right up front uh, to kind of set the tone for these next few slides. So moving into critical infrastructure updates, uh, again, the, really the one that this happened a few days ago, but uh, the Biden regime has begun fining lingering containers, uh, $100 per container per day for every container that's that's stuck waiting in line. Um, so this is kind of, again, this is like trying to buy your way out of debt. It doesn't really work like that. Uh, the Biden regime is, if not directly responsible, a huge, heavy, invisible hand that is causing these uh, logistical backups, particularly the ones in the ports, uh, the port congestion, right? If, if the Biden regime is not directly responsible for it, they're like responsible for 80% of that problem. And be, due to the problem they cause, they are now going to slap a fine on top of that, which again, exacerbates the problem. So it's like, guys, you created the problem and now you're fining people for the problem that you created. You know, it, it's, 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 it's backwards. And I think that Again, nothing that this regime does would really surprise me. However, I do find it interesting that they, clearly somebody in the White House, thinks that this might be somewhat of an interesting solution. And I think that that kind of shows how little thought is actually going into the economy um, up there in Washington because it... This this solution would have been laughed at, like it would have been openly mocked in any sort of committee in Congress and openly mocked by both parties ridiculously um, by, just a few years ago. But now it's like, oh, it's a, it's a good solution. Well, how in what universe would that ever be a solution? Find the people that <laughs> that are that are stuck waiting in line and you're the one who put them in the line. Like, you know, it doesn't really make any sense. Right. Um, and then secondly, moving on, switching topics considerably, the NRA was hit with a ransomware attack. No surprise there. Ransomware attacks have become kind of a staple. Um, again, we've talked a lot about ransomware attacks in the past. There's really not more to add on this, considering I haven't seen very much from the NRA. Um, don't tend to follow the NRA so much, you know, for obvious reasons, but... You know, I uh, just wanted to point that out that they did get hacked and most likely private information was compromised. Uh, and then thirdly, like I mentioned, these mandate walkouts are becoming a huge deal, um, particularly in New York. New York has gotten the most press uh, because the NYPD, the New York Fire Department, uh, those guys have they've had a lot of walkouts. Uh, a lot of people call in sick, all kinds of things like that. Um, and it's going to be a very interesting time for particularly New York, but really any major city, because as we learned, uh, once something hits the press and it ha is happening in one city, it tends to happen in other cities. So we'll see how many other major cities are, are going to be faced with the same thing. Chicago is also being impacted by these mandate walkouts, as we as we learned last week. They're even threatening to use the National Guard to come in, but uh, there's more to more to the story than that as we'll talk about here in just a second. And then likewise, uh, number four there, this was kind of a funny one. Uh, the airline pilot uh, walkouts continue to occur. American Airlines is the latest company uh, that has been kind of hit with the, these uh, rogue pilots. Uh, actually, somebody recorded, um, I can't play it here obviously due to YouTube's policies, but uh, somebody recorded audio and uh, they've been people have been listening to uh, pilots transmitting uh, the phrase LGB, right? on uh, the guard frequency, so on the, on the aircraft emergency frequency of 121.5, uh, people have been observed, or pilots have been uh, heard uh, saying that phrase uh, right as they sign off um, and walk out. So I thought that was kind of hilarious that, that it's, it's, now, it's now a huge thing in the airline community. And then likewise, the American Trucking Association, they've kind of come out of the woodwork and, and said that you know, they've indicated that they're, they're willing to uh, consider dropping federal contracts rather than impose mandates. Now, again, the American Trucking Association has not said this, that's what they're going to do. They've come out and they're, they're kind of like dipping their toe into the water and kind of fielding that as a uh, topic of conversation in the media. They've come out and said that, hey, several of our, you know, 
our, our members are talking about dropping these federal contracts and just kind of dealing with the, the financial loss of that rather than impose these mandates and have all of our employees and our drivers walk off the job. So, again, very interesting uh, stuff, very interesting times we see uh, moving forward. But we'll talk more about this stuff in just a minute. So let's move right into significant governmental actions. And the first one of which is OSHA. So OSHA has been in the press kind of a lot lately, but... Uh, this is one that uh, we pulled directly from their website. They actually have a frequently asked questions page when it comes to these mandates. And this is a screenshot, of course, censored for YouTube. Uh, but this is a screenshot of their webpage. And as you can see, they are, quote, uh, OSHA does not wish to have any appearance of discouraging workers from receiving the blank blank, right? Uh, and it also does not wish to de-incentivize employers' blank efforts. As a result... OSHA will not enforce 29 CFR 1904's recording requirements to require any employers to record worker side effects from the blank blank, at least through May of next year. So that's interesting. OSHA is now openly concealing adverse reactions to the, 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 the blank, right? So I think that's kind of interesting. They're, they're, it's, 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 you cannot be any more open than this. Why would they want why would they try to do this unless they're trying to cover something up so i thought that was kind of interesting uh to highlight that osha is is definitely doing this and it's very interesting very interesting times ahead right and like i mentioned uh or sort of alluded to before the biden regime is kind of there like i mentioned last briefing they are uh they're getting what they wish for and i don't think they want it um, because they're starting to backpedal a little bit, right? A, the regime is like signal that they're extending the deadlines that really didn't exist in the first place. They're, you know, they're quietly removing deadlines. They're they're just kind of like softly backing away from this because they dug themselves into such a hole and they've been doubling down this entire time that they're kind of softly backing away. However. At the same time, they're also doubling down. So in some areas, they're backing off, like with the airlines. They're they're kind of backing off from that, but they're also doubling down in other areas. But it, it's really such a hard thing to explain because the coercion is no longer working anymore. It, we're starting to see see the the power of coercing people into getting the jab that that is is waning quite significantly. So they're going to have to resort to force if they want to get this stuff through. And in a lot of areas, they can't. The U.S. government does not have the ability to force a lot of this stuff, even if they wanted to. They, they don't have the numbers of people on their side to, to force really a lot, anything, honestly. But they can get some of the top, uh, top people. So they're going now with more serious threats, more serious uh, fines and things like that. But again, we'll talk more about that in just a minute. And then moving on to number three there. Uh, number three is the uh, not family-friendly... Uh, news item for today. I say news item because there's really not much intel value there. It just kind of points out um, the a, a lot of the uh, the stuff that's going on in the public school system, which we'll talk about there on point six. So I don't want to get too deep into the weeds with this. I just wanted to point it out that it happened and that this quote that's on screen uh, actually was said by a former president of the United States in in response to this uh, situation. Um, yeah, I, I I really hesitate to even bring it up, but because it doesn't really have any intel value, uh, that really honestly, but it is something that is it's it's an issue, and um, a lot of people who have kids in public school, I think, probably would would uh, like to know that this occurred. Um, so you can read more uh, more on this situation that occurred in Virginia. Uh, we're really on the edge of uh, Virginia and D.C. Um, it's been all over a lot of the news sites. So, yeah, you can dig more into that. I, I, I don't really know how much of this is true, uh, the story itself. Um, but I just wanted to point it out that, hey, hey, this occurs. This is one of those, like, hey, hey, go research it more type things. Also, number four there, uh, again, another one of those, hey, go research this more thing. Uh, Rutgers University, we've got uh, professors now openly calling for quote, taking out uh, uh, people of a, a certain racial demographic. And that's uh, that's not good, uh, obviously. So as we can see, the rhetoric uh, is allowed to continue anymore. Man, I, like, I, I don't know about anybody else, but even just a few years ago, like, 
uh, I remember when if anybody made a, a vaguely threatening like YouTube comment, they got you know reported to you know the police or something like that, and 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 they had to answer questions like you post something threatening on a Facebook page in some group, and you get a knock on your door. But you know these professors in, in a lot of universities are allowed to openly talk about this rhetoric. And again, we've 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 talked about the power of rhetoric a lot before in previous podcasts and things like that. Um, so. Yeah, definitely something to look into because dehumanization is definitely a huge talking point for a lot of people these days. So just wanted to point that out. And then again, uh, number five there, AT and T. Um, you know, they're they're going down the road of uh, uh, the you know promoting CRT. Very interesting that a lot of companies are going down that road. I can't foresee why, other than just you know wokeism is is rampant. And then number six there again. Um, for lack of a better term, I'm just going to call this public school degeneracy, um, because we've had a lot of it. We've had a lot of incidents in public schools lately. Um, again, people who have kids in public schools know this, uh, of course, a lot a lot better than we do. But like, it, it's become a, a pretty big issue. Like in Hazard, Kentucky, there, you know, having uh, high school students engage in you know cross dressing and exotic dancing for school administrators during a homecoming event. I can't think in what world that would be appropriate or, or even something that does not result in the police showing up and handcuffs going on some school administrators instantly. But again, since it happened in the school system, like we excuse it, right? So I guess that's kind of the way that goes for now. But again, a lot of these points, you know, points three, four, five, and six really don't have a whole lot of particular intel value is as far as COAs and you know co- courses of action going forward but it's just like hey look man our, our education system is 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 beyond failing at this point and we need to start figuring out what we need to do with regards to you know how to move forward in, the, in this troubling time of, of public school education right so I, I did just want to put those points on there because I think it's worth talking about even though I myself don't have any any hope of a solution for it just yet. Um, But again, like I mentioned last time, just because we don't have a solution for something does not mean that we can ignore the problem. So we're not ignoring the problem. Wanted to put it up there and and show everybody what's going on. So let's go back into talking about these mandates for a bit. So, So hopefully, like the past couple of slides have shown, the impact of a company canceling their federal contracts and, uh, of course, not having as much funding to move forward because of that, that can still have quite an impact. And let's talk about the actual impact that it can have. For instance, firearms manufacturers, they're the ones who literally have military weapons contracts. Like, I mean, there you go. And then also you've got other things too, like as we all know from the past few months, uh, SIG, the the SIG P320 has had some significant problems with their massive uh, government contract. And who's going to fix those problems? You know, it's going to have to be SIG. Again, a private company, a so-called private company, right? Again, similar situation with ammunition manufacturers. If they decide to not make ammunition or if they get shut down by the federal government because they didn't go along with a mandate, where's the DOD going to get that ammunition that they need, right? Again, a very important impact. Auto companies, again, who builds the vehicles used by federal agencies? You know, it's not exactly the federal government doing this. It's got to be a private company making these. Same thing with the tires, tire manufacturers. Even the tires made for the president's limousine, the Beast, are made by a private company, Goodyear. So, again, (laughs) <laughs> you know, if the government wants to wants to play this game, I don't think they want the result, right? Tech companies, again, can the can the average person, the average prepared citizen, survive without the internet or with any kind of technical system? Maybe, maybe not. I would argue probably no. I would say most most citizens probably can't survive without the internet. Um, but can the U.S. government survive without the internet? Absolutely not. There is no way they can survive without the internet uh, whatsoever. So that's how they maintain their control of everything. So again, huge impact. Food service industry, you might not think of that as being quite significant, but again, who feeds the troops on U.S. bases? You know, it's usually some kind of contracting company. If the DFAC workers suddenly don't, don't show up to work, well, where are troops going to eat? You know, uh, you know. again, the fast food restaurants on all military bases, they're, run, they have, they're federal contracted. They're like actual fast food, you know, private companies, right? 
you know, also who runs, literally, who runs a congressional uh, cafeteria, canteen, whatever, whatever you want to call it. Like, literally, where do congressmen go to lunch? <laughs> you know, or at least their aides and their staff workers. Well, you know, it's certainly a private company who has a contract with the federal government. Another one, landscaping companies. You might not think of landscaping companies as being a critical industry, but who maintains airstrips? You know, the, who mows the uh, the grass in between uh, taxiways and things like that? Again, it might not be such an issue for for things like paved runways and things like that. But what about smaller airstrips, right? What about the the training zones like paratrooper drop zones and things like that, staging areas, training areas on military bases. A lot of times those have to be conducted in fields or in large open spaces that have to be mowed. And if they're not mowed, you know, can, can training be conducted? Well, I'm sure it can, but again, it just provides another problem that the government has to deal with. Another more severe, severe one is security zones and fields of observation. You know, the landscaping in a lot of federal agencies is kept at a very specific level because it has to uh, abide by things like uh, security camera, fields of vision, and things like that. Even things like the temporary helipad for Marine One, like who mows the lawn at the White House? You know, I'm pretty sure it's not a military service member. It's got to be some kind of federal contractor that has, you know, of course, a very high clearance. But still, like, it's going to be some dude on a lawnmower, right? Construction companies, similar situation. Who fixes the toilets in the White House? Like maintenance and construction is a huge thing in in a lot of places. And I say you know the the White House specifically because uh, there's this kind of atmosphere that the that the the elites of the country, you know, the White House and Congress, can isolate themselves. Right? They can put up fences around themselves and isolate themselves from the American people, so that when the American people try to question them or call them on their actions, they physically can't get close enough to actually do anything. Right? Well, guess what? Who put up that fence? I'm pretty sure it wasn't members of Congress sitting out there with you know. Uh, hammers and, and wrenches and things putting up these fences. It was a contracting company. Well, what if that company said that they're not going to put the fence up? Well, who have they got to get? Another company. Well, what if that company doesn't say they're going to put the fence up? Do you see the, the power uh, the, the word no has when it comes to federal contracting? is very significant. Same thing with airlines. Airlines are in a unique situation, but in which they are very heavily regulated by, of course, the FAA. However, and of course, you know the president and most other politicians have their own private transportation that's that's all you know you know cared for and things like that. But here's the deal: what about the tens of thousands of other people that are needed to enforce whatever the POTUS and senior politicians mandate? You see, like we can't afford to put all of their underlings on a private jet. It just doesn't work like that. And if the airlines are down, you know how's that going to work out for them? Same thing for public utilities, right? You know the White House and Congress, of course, they have backups for generators and things like that to make sure the power never goes out. But here's the deal. What about the literally thousands of other staff offices and other agencies in just around the Washington area that are needed for the government to function, right? They think they can isolate themselves, but clearly they can't. And finally, rail. Like we talk about the trucking shortages and things like that. Man, like, okay, the trucking shortage is bad enough. You know, truck drivers saying, you know, no, not no, but hell no, and they're walking off the job because of a, a medical mandate or something like that. That's bad enough as is. That can cripple a country right there. But here's the thing. What about rail? Like, uh, last time I checked, you know, most, if not all, armored vehicles are transported around the country by rail. So it's a, it's a, it's almost like a national defense issue at this point. You can't move your tanks around because there's no uh, locomotive conductors to actually drive the train, right? And then also things like coal, oil, natural gas. Yeah, sure, a lot of these go by, you know, pipeline and things like that, but a lot of it doesn't. A lot of a lot of oil in this country is transported by rail, and the same thing with natural gas and stuff like that. So, again, uh, it, it all comes back to the theme of the the Biden regime or or whatever regime that you want to call it. They are they're they're doing these mandate things. They're they're backing off in some areas because they realize they're up against a brick wall, but they're doubling down in other areas um, with the threats and things like that. Um, but it's clear that I, I don't think that they're going to that, that I don't think they want what I don't think they they don't want what they think they want 
and it's clear that a lot of the uh, a lot of the country can seriously stop this if they wanted to just by simply saying no to federal contracts. So it's going to be interesting to see how this all works out, and uh, it's definitely going to be something to keep an eye on because. And, and that's why preparedness is such an issue, because <laughs> you want to be more prepared than the government is, right? If, if, the, gov if, if the government says, you know, your local electricity, your local uh, power generation co-op, if, if it mandates those workers to get, you know, the jab, and those workers walk out and there's nobody to fix, you know, uh, power downed power lines. We are coming into the winter season where, you know, power lines go down all the time. But if they don't have workers to do that, um, you need to be able to, to function in an environment without electricity, without heating, things like that. Again, something that most Americans can't do. But uh, also, it's a time where I would think that mo more Americans than ever before are capable of, of uh, playing this game of chicken. And uh, that's really what it is. So I guess we'll have to see how this game of chicken goes on because it looks like it's going to turn out in the favor of the American people. I don't want to be too too optimistic, but but man, even just the the small example of industries that I have on the slide here, this is like one of a hundred I could think of, you know, slides on this topic. Just looking at these industries, man, you can cripple a government like this very very easily. And this slide shows that you can see how every company that has a federal contract actually has the upper hand. These companies can hurt the government more than the government can hurt them. And the best part about all of this is that it won't really affect the citizenry that much. Um, if an office supply distributor, let's just say an office, dis an office supply distributor, were to cancel their contract with the federal government to provide, you know, like pens and, and, and copier paper, right? That would impact the government. But that company can still sell their products to the citizenry, right? Now, sure, at some point, there will be something that uh, if the federal contract was canceled, it would also affect the citizenry. I'm thinking things like national defense stuff, but, but right now, the disconnect between government and the people, right, is so great, and the bureaucracy is so bloated that you could probably cancel 90% of all federal contracts, and the citizenry would not be affected hardly at all. And it gets even better, actually, because a lot of these companies are being forced into canceling their contracts by their workers. A, you know, a, company, has, a, a company has a couple of choices, uh, either enforce the mandates or not enforce the mandates. And if they enforce the mandates, a significant portion of their workforce will leave, as evidenced by the recent wave of walkouts. Maybe not enough to matter in a lot of cases, but as we are clearly seeing, Enough people are rising up to hurt the company's bottom line. Surprising, I know. I would not have expected this level of resistance at this stage, but anyway. So a company can either enforce the mandates and have their workforce walk out, which will result in them not being able to fulfill the federal contract anyway. Or they could cancel the federal contract, keep their workforce, and bid for new contracts with uh, like state-level government or even just a civilian market. This, of course, is an oversimplification of the issue, and a lot of other things can happen, like, like with Southwest Airlines. Uh, they backtracked on enforcing their mandate, but they are still keeping their government contracts. So the ball is in the federal government's court. They could, the government could crack down and say that Southwest is in violation of the executive order. They could do that and cancel the contract or, or fine Southwest or, or whatever. But clearly, the government needs Southwest Airlines more than Southwest Airlines needs the government. Couple this with every airline not forgetting how poorly they were treated when it came to the government bailouts last year, and the Biden regime starting to realize that they, are, that they royally screwed up, and they are now being forced to backtrack in some industries like the airlines. Well, from this we can see that the resistance is working in a lot of areas, so... I guess more to come on that front, but this grand game of chicken that, that's going on is, is very interesting to watch, and um, it's definitely, uh, definitely a good idea to prepare for the, the, the eventuality that some company or some contracting company will just say nope and not provide any services to the government. If that if in, ends up affecting you in some way, that would be a good idea to be aware of. 
And quickly wrapping up today's brief, let's talk about the uh, military deployments that have been going on around the country. So uh, up in the Northeast region, really not a whole lot of updates. Um, Massachusetts is still doing their thing. New York is still doing their thing. No real major update there. Same in the Southeast, no major update. We're seeing forces uh, move around a little bit, so hopefully we'll, we'll be able to get some updated numbers. Um, but for right now, there's, there's really nothing more I've got on this one. Uh, this is really the only update I've got for this slide is... Um, that the Illinois deployment is most likely not going to happen. Thank, thank goodness, right? Um, as I mentioned last last time, the Illinois governor threatened to deploy the National Guard uh, in a domestic policing occupation force uh, in the event that the Chicago Police Department they had a, they had a lot of officers walk off the job uh, due to the mandates. However, right now it looks like that deployment is, is kind of on hold and probably not going to occur just yet because a judge just recently put a hold on Chicago's police jab mandate. So a judge said that uh, the mayor, uh, the governor, whoever cannot mandate uh, Chicago police officers to get uh, the mandate uh, just yet. So. Uh, that's that's something that's you know it's good news for you know obviously anybody in the area but uh, yeah something to keep an eye on I just wanted to point that out that you know it looks like that situation is going to simmer down but I just wanted to leave it on the slide to kind of talk about it for just a little bit and then moving into the southwest again no real major updates here uh, other than we're seeing a lot more troops be deployed I don't have good numbers uh, I know that uh, we've had the same numbers on the slide for gosh a couple weeks now and there's really no update update from our end, although we do know that more troops are moving into the area. Um, we'll get back to you and provide a better uh, situational understanding of what's going on at the border. But again, border situation heating up uh, in, in just in general. And then, of course, out west, really no major change. There are Oregon's drawing down, uh, Montana and Wyoming. Still have some troops uh, stationed at local area hospitals doing all kinds of menial taskings and things like that. And then for the school attendance mask mandates, really no major update here, so I'm just going to skip past it. Also, no update uh, to the jab mandates, though again, I, I know I keep pointing out, but I just wanted to highlight again that we are seeing even more resistance in California uh, from parents who don't want uh, don't want this to go forward. And then overall, the medical resistance tracker, really no change from last brief. It's just kind of, we're kind of status quo, right, because there haven't been really anything in writing. Now, I'm sure this slide will change quite significantly because we're seeing a little bit of chatter um, in kind of the social media sphere that the Biden regime is going to come out with some new mandates for private businesses uh, within the next few days or weeks. We, there's literally nothing on, on uh, that we can do about it until they do something. Um, so we'll see how that plays out. Um, again, I, it, it's one of those weird situations where You've got the Biden regime kind of backing down from the airlines because they realize how important the airlines are and the fact that they can't really enforce the the uh, mandates on the airlines. However, you might have them also double down and come out with mandates for private companies that they just kind of hope will stick, right? That's kind of the Biden's approach, uh, the Biden regime's approach to a lot of this stuff is just see what sticks uh, when it comes to the mandates. So I guess we'll we'll see how that goes. And finishing things up on the international relations front, I went ahead and uh, removed the animations from this slide just to see what it would look like. Might, may go back to it, maybe not, who knows. Uh, but as far as uh, international issues goes, Russia, uh, <laughs> there are quite high tensions between the United States and Russia right now. It's really nothing nothing too severe, but relations between Russia and the United States are, are worsening uh, with various diplomats being recalled from each other's country and things like that. So really not a great time uh, for the, the international diplomacy between the United States and Russia. I mean, this is due to a variety of factors, everything from uh, the strategic arms limitations talks and the you know nuclear test ban treaty stuff they were talking about a few months ago that really nobody cared about. Um, and all kinds of stuff to do with China and the EU and Brexit. It's, it's little things that kind of add up all over the place. Um, and, of course, the United States' relations with pretty much every nation on Earth are, are pretty severe right now. Like, the United States' uh, relations between the U.S. and the United Kingdom, man, they're really poor right now. Same thing with Australia. You know, Iran, pretty much any country you can think of, the United States has really poor relations with right now. Um, unfortunately, a lot of these countries that we have poor relations with are our allies, like, you know, or, or close to our allies, like France, right? So, 
not a good situation for the United States right now. Um, but also, you know, Russia is, uh, they're doing Russian things, right? So uh, moving on to Australia and New Zealand, it's kind of a two for one there. Uh, Australia and New Zealand have, have really jumped and jumped headlong into full on totalitarianism at this point. Like, not even from an American's perspective, because honestly, even before all of this stuff happened, like before, you know, the, the pandemic stuff, uh, you know, an, an average American might look at Australia's laws or New Zealand's laws and they might say, you know what, that's a little bit draconian, right? Um, but just taking that and taking that out of the equation, right? Looking at the pers- looking from the perspective of Australia and New Zealand's, you know, unique history as an Australian or a New Zealander, um, it, things are getting kind of insane at this point. Like that, the New Zealand government is openly creating a caste system of jabbed and unjabbed, uh, with resources going to the jabbed and the unjabbed basically being shunned from society. And they're they're publicly admitting to this. Like it's crazy. And Australia, really, honestly in Australia, the situation is kind of unique because all of the stuff that we're seeing, all the bad stuff we're com- seeing coming out of Australia is mostly just the states of Victoria and New South Wales. Now, I'm sure this is occurring in other states as well, but um, Australia as a whole, right, especially Victoria and New South Wales are really not far behind uh, from New Zealand's kind of, man, uh, crazy stuff going on. Uh, also, like I mentioned, China, there's a lot more uh, talk about China's hypersonic nukes. They've done a lot of new testing of new systems, allegedly, that are probably not new. Um, so, again, we've got a separate video on that. But, yeah, China is still, still a pretty big factor, and it's very interesting that the United States has a lot of domestic issues at the same time that China is definitely a rising power in the strategic uh, defense game. And finally, Germany is uh, forming a new government. Uh, Angela Merkel's party lost, so Merkel is out, and uh, she, they are going to be forming a uh, new transit transitionary government uh, to uh, take over. And we'll see how that goes because uh, <laughs> the the Merkel's party has had kind of a hard time over the past few years, but they've also held power for a very long time. So uh, the times they are a changing, and I guess we'll see how that works out for the stability of Europe and really the you know the EU as a whole, I guess. So. That's really all I have for today. Uh, again, thank you all for your support. Um, it really does help us uh, move forward into a lot of more of our uh, more educational videos uh, that we've got coming up. So hopefully uh, we'll have those out pretty soon. But again, thank you to everyone who supports us. And here are your sources for today. Uh, there's slide one, slide two, slide three, and slide four. So as always, all of these slides will be available in PDF form on our Odyssey page right alongside this video. So uh, if you don't like YouTube, if you don't like what YouTube is doing, all of our videos, is the very second they go uh, live on YouTube, they uh, pop up on Odyssey as well. So if you prefer to watch on Odyssey, go for it. Uh, we just, you know, we get a much larger reach on YouTube. So unfortunately, we have to kind of sit here for the time being. But we also publish things on Odyssey as well. So just wanted to point that out. So thank you again, everyone, for watching. And this has been kind of a really fast-paced, a uh, lot of stuff going on in this briefing today. But hopefully it was helpful. And I guess we'll see you next time. So as always, fight in the shade.